Tonight, we are devoting the entire show to the race for Massachusetts Attorney General. I'm joined now by the two Democratic candidates, one of whom will square off against the lone Republican candidate, John Miller, in the general election in November. This is not really a debate. It's more of a conversation touching on the news of the day and the issues facing the state. So there aren't really any specific ground rules other than decorum, of course. With that, let me introduce my guests. Maura Healy is a resident of Charlestown who served until recently as an assistant attorney general under Martha Coakley. Before that, she was a Middlesex County prosecutor and in private practice at Wilmer Hale. Warren Tolman is a resident of Watertown and works at the law firm Holland and Knight. From 1991 until 1999, he served as a state legislator, first in the House and then as a senator. Welcome to both Thank of you. Thank you, Emily. Great Thanks to have for you having here. Us. Great Thanks to for be taking here. out in this beautiful summer day. I want to start with something that's going on in the news right now in, not here, but in Ferguson, Missouri. And this has to do with the shooting death of an unarmed black teenager last week by a police officer there. In the wake of that, we've seen this horrendous reaction, I mean, from both sides, from the police and from, we've seen looting and rioting. But now, as of today, police were using force, uh, tear gas, to try to push back crowds. My question, I'll start with you, Maura. I mean, is this excessive use of force by a, a municipal police force. Does, this is the citizenry who's unhappy with how information has come out and they're not giving the name of the police officer and some other things. Are they handling this well? I don't think they are as, at, at all, um, as we've seen from the images you just showed. You know, I, I think about what I would do as attorney general in this sort of situation. Um, and the role of the attorney general is the chief law enforcement officer, the people's lawyer. And it is incredibly important that people have faith in government and in the actions of law enforcement. And I say that as somebody who's been a prosecutor and as somebody who has been chief of the Civil Rights Division in the Attorney General's office. And so what I see now is terrible. There should be accountability. There should be transparency. There was no need to withhold the name of that officer. And people are frustrated. Mm -hmm. People are frustrated. The public is frustrated. Press is frustrated. And you see that playing out and escalating. And that is absolutely unnecessary. It would not happen here in Massachusetts if I were Attorney General. Um, and we need to, to uh, certainly make sure mm -hmm. that we're taking every effort. When it comes to uh, training police officers on racial profiling, uh, working to reduce uh, instances of police misconduct. These are all mm. proper rules for the AG. I mean, even the United States Attorney General weighed on this one today, Warren. What, what would you do if you were Attorney General? Well, we've seen it a number of instances. This is the most recent. We saw it with the chokehold a couple weeks ago yeah. with the young, the young father in who New York, lost his... Staten exactly. Island. Yeah. Exactly. So this isn't the first time, and if we don't act, it, it won't be the last. And what I would do as a leader in Massachusetts is call upon everybody and sit down together and to work on the issues. Of our our police training, I, I think, is pretty good, but we rank 47th in the country in police training per capita. Um, the, the best trained police force is going to be best equipped to deal with these issues. Uh, but it's about leadership. It's about people being accountable for their actions. And specifically, what, what I would do if I were attorney general and I were in Missouri, I would go to the local police. Uh, I would sit down with them. I would grab some of the community leaders and bring them together and say, look, this cannot happen uh, and we need to, you know, sunshine is the best disinfectant here and we need to make whoever is accountable for, for these actions uh, be accountable and, and to, to, to obviously let the public know what transpired. But, but you know, Warren, this seems to be a trend, maybe since September 11th, but certainly we saw it during the chase, the manhunt for the Boston Marathon bombers sort of the militarization of the police force and, and, and even the self-deployment. I mean, there's this, there, there seems to be a bravado that we've never seen before. Police departments were never all that popular. They have become extremely unpopular in recent years. Well, you know, I live in Watertown. I know. And I was in the epicenter and the perimeter of where the manhunt w took place. And I interacted with the brave men and women there. The SWAT team came through my house. Frankly, it was, a, it was an impetus for why I get in this race, because I saw what they were doing, how they were trying to make a difference. And when they're in your ba basement with M4 machine guns uh, and you see the guns turn, you think it's going to go down in your basement. It has an impact on you. So I had a very positive experience mm -hmm. with them. But I know that there are instances where police overreach. 
and that goes back to training. But I'm concerned about the over-militarization of the police force. I'm also concerned about uh, over-surveillance, these license mm -hmm. scanners, these mm -hmm. private and public drones that are out there. We need to be a, a watch guard to ensure that no individual, no law-abiding individual, has to worry about his or her privacy invaded by the public or private entities at any point. And as Attorney General, that will be one of my primary roles and, and, and primary uh, issues that I will work on with, with all of our uh, police uh, on the state level as well as on the uh, local level. Mm -hmm. And I, and I certainly agree with a lot of that sentiment. I've had direct experience working with police, working with district attorney's offices uh, over my last seven years in the attorney general's office and before that. And um, I've been involved with training police uh, on how to respond to and identify hate crimes as an example. And I agree, police training is really important in this state and as attorney general, as the chief law enforcement officer, I'll certainly use my experience and make sure that we have the right training in place to deal with situations. That includes uh, situations where there are racial issues, where there are mental health issues. We've also seen in this country and even in the state certain instances where police have come up upon a scene, a person with a mental illness presents, mm -hmm. and somebody mm -hmm. ends up dead. Right. And that's not right. And as a civil rights lawyer, it breaks my heart when you think of Trayvon Martin and you see what's going on right now in Ferguson. You know, my job as Attorney General, I know, will be to make sure that people are held accountable when they cross the line and that we are doing everything mm -hmm. to fight systemic I discrimination. Move on to other. we got a lot of stuff to cover mm -hmm. here. Warren. Can I just say yeah. one thing? The, the issue of mental health and substance yeah. abuse where 80% of the mm -hmm. people that are incarcerated in jails is a real passion of mine. It has been for many years. and It's something that we need to address. Mental health parity is the law of the land, except it's not when someone who goes to a hospital is, is stabilized because of their mental illness and then released. If they have a heart condition, we keep them, we find a bed for them. The same ought to be true for, for, for a, a brain condition. Uh, mental illness and the stigma often affixed to it has to be removed. I will lead on that issue. I will work with groups like the National Alliance Against Mental Illness and, and really try to make a difference on, on, on mental health and, and uh, behavioral health sciences. All right, another story that we all want to go away is this market basket, which dragged on. It's going to be starting a fifth week next mm -hmm. week. As you know, Governor Deval Patrick Mora weighed in on this yesterday. Mm -hmm urged all of the employees, the full-time ones anyway, because part-timers can't go back, to go back to work tomorrow. Is this the role of a chief executive to get involved at that level? Uh, of a governor, perhaps. I think that we have all been so distressed as customers, as people who have family members working at Market Basket, um, those who know suppliers who've really been experiencing the devastating ripple effects of this really unfortunate, acrimonious dispute between a family business. Um, and, and so I appreciate and applaud the governor for reaching out and exercising leadership there. Um, and I hope that they can resolve it soon. Certainly as attorney general, I'm mindful that uh, as attorney general, I'll tell you in my experience what the role of the attorney general is in, in that office, is to make sure that workers who are working get paid the wages mm -hmm. that they're due, that they're not mistreated. Um, before when there were threats of, of layoffs for those who were participating uh, in the strikes and the protests, um, you know, that the job of the attorney general would be, and, and I think the attorney general uh, did the right thing in, in issuing the statement about the need for uh, the owners to right. respect the law. But Warren, given the fact that there's no illegal activity that we know of, I mean, what can the state really do other than, you know, give out platitudes and say, you guys got to resolve this? Yeah, Moore is right about the role of the attorney general in terms of the wages and making sure that they get treated appropriately. But it's larger than that. If I were attorney general, I would not be waiting for the governor to act. I would have gone to Arthur T. and then I would have gone to Arthur S. And I said, look, you've I think got... he tried that, didn't he? <laughs> I, I don't know that anyone, <laughs> the governor might have tried that in the last few yeah. days, but this has been going on for weeks. Yeah. I wouldn't have waited weeks, frankly. Uh, I would have uh, sat down with them uh, and said, look, you've got thousands of consumers, thousands of employees, and the sub-vendors. It's having a negative impact on lots of people's lives, including some of my volunteers in my campaign. Their families are being directly affected by it as a result of loss of income. It's a time for leadership. And you don't wait, you don't try to search the statute to say, oh, gee, can I do this? 
things. No, often the authority comes with apparent authority. It's not necessarily statutory authority. This is about leadership. It's about standing up and going to these folks and saying, look, you've got to get together here. You've got to push it and put pressure internally mm -hmm. as well as externally on these folks. And when you do that with leadership, whether you have the authority or not, they will listen. That's what leaders do. That's what I've tried to do in my tenure in the public sector in the eight years I was in the legislature. And that's what I've tried to do as, as a private sector attorney. By the way, where do you grocery mm -hmm. shop? Uh, we go to Shaw's most of the time. How about you, Mark? Uh, supermarket basket in Chelsea until oh, until of late. We but just one comment on that because I, I agree, leadership is important. But you know, um, it's also important to recognize the role and responsibility of different constitutional officers. And you know, I support the governor in doing what he's mm -hmm. doing. I don't, you know, I don't know that we want an attorney general who's going to show up on people's doorsteps. Usually, we do that when we have a subpoena in hand. So, you know, I think the role is to support the workers, to support uh, and enforce the law. That's really important. Okay. So it's right. about leadership. Uh, it, we don't have a market basket near me in Watertown. Yeah. I wish we did. I, I understand there might be one coming, Speaking hopefully soon. Speaking of shopping, I'm curious to know if either one of you has ever been in one of these medical marijuana dispensaries, maybe in Colorado or in California, and are you aware of how it works once you get a prescription, what you, are, what you have access to, does either of you know? I've not been in one, no. Have you? I have not been in one. Um, but I know. stunned. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've seen the images on TV and, and I've seen what's happening there. And, and to me, you know, based on my experience in the Attorney General's office where you're advising state agencies like the Department of Public Health that's handling the licensure right now, it's really important that we have transparency and that public safety yeah, because, is protected. Let me just say, no other prescription works like this that once you get your prescription, you can go basically go shopping yeah. in the pharmacy. Usually the prescription is for something. So, Warren, I'm curious about you. Mm -hmm. Since you were so dead set against tobacco, the number one public health enemy, why do you support this? Well, for, for starters, I support it because the people voted for it, and I think that people's vote ought to mean something, first off. But secondly, with respect to this process, it's DPA, DPH has run, I think it's been a disaster. And I've called on them to restart it all over again. You have people on an application today that then they file the final application the next day and all of a sudden people are removed, new people mm -hmm. have surfaced, people had criminal convictions and the like. Time out here. You should not be granting provisional licenses or real licenses to people who are changing their application at the 11th hour. Their intent was, I think, in many instances to deceive. Start it all over. You messed up the process. And, 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 and as Speaker Delia was right in this instance, you ought to, to, to start from the start, go, go, go back over and, and redo this process. It's been a disaster. Okay, but is this not just a charade at this point? The, the genie is out of the bottle. What are we doing with these little dinky, you know, dispensaries? Why, why not just legalize marijuana, period? Well, I'm, I'm um, of the view that, that we do need more accountability in the system, and the way this has been rolled out hasn't been very effective. And I have real concerns. I'm a consumer advocate. Would you advocate. not just legalize marijuana? No, I would not. Yeah. I would not. You know, Emily, I have, I have real concerns about addiction, uh, particularly addiction when it comes to, to young people. Yeah. And I think certainly marijuana is no, addictive. As a gateway drug, you mean? Sure, sure. And, and, you know, it is really important, um, particularly for the Attorney General, and I've had experience doing that, protecting consumers, uh, dealing with issues of public safety. So you're worried it about people with the prescriptions getting addicted? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the things I think we've seen, look, we've seen with prescription drugs mm -hmm. how addictive some of those drugs are. It's why I've put forward a really comprehensive plan to get after prescription drug abuse and to get after what we're seeing now with a heroin scourge. You know, we can't have uh, drugs that are addictive be made that much more accessible and available, particularly to young people. And this seems like the Wild West, really. And so as Attorney General, it's going to be really important that we have a consumer advocate in that office, that we have somebody who understands mm -hmm. how to protect public safety. Safety. And I, w I bring my experience um, to bear on these issues. I, my concerns are less about the addictiveness of marijuana. Obviously, opiates and, and, and the, those type of drugs are highly addictive, and we need to do a better job holding big pharma accountable and also making sure that the small number of doctors who are prescribing a large number of these pills, 20% of physicians prescribe 80% of the pills, are held accountable. But with respect to marijuana specifically, uh, gateway drug, absolutely. And also, frankly, there's a recent study out a few months which talked about the negative 
negative impact it has on uh, a young adult's brains. Uh, and they showed different brain scans that had a negative impact uh, as a did result of smoking smoke marijuana? marijuana. I did, and you know, a that's, lot. That, not <laughs> a, a lot, kid, no. uh, not a lot. But you know, who knows? If if yeah. maybe I'd have a full head of hair if I hadn't <laughs> smoked it. <laughs> no, seriously, um, it, it does. The, yeah. the MRIs or the brain scans that have been conducted indicate that there was some negative impact. And until I'm sure that there are, is no negative impact there, and I'm sure that it's not a gateway drug, I'm not going to be one who's going to be pushing for legalization in Massachusetts. But I think we ought to just to clarify. Marijuana is legalized here to a no, certain to extent. extent. I know that. And the medical marijuana bill that's been passed, I recognize that the, the importance of that and the job of the Attorney General is to make that law work. And that includes making sure that people are properly, properly licensed, people are able to, um, to access the drugs who need them, um, because we have a lot of people who are dealing with serious health issues who really need the drugs. So as Attorney General, I want to work mm -hmm. to implement the law and make it work for the right. people who need it. Maura, as you know, your, your boss, Martha Coakley, was very disappointed with the United States Supreme Court ruling on buffer zones, basically saying that the 35-foot rule was mm -hmm. unconstitutional, a violation of people's First Amendment rights. But now, they're, they've painted these lines shorter now, the white used to be yellow lines, um, so you can step closer to the people going mm -hmm. in for clinical services. But now they're saying it's up to the discretion of the police to determine whether somebody is being harassed. Is that better? I don't think it's better, Emily. And, you know, I come with this ex with experience. When I was chief of the Civil Rights Division, I worked on that buffer zone law. I trained police on that law. I trained district attorneys. I worked with clinic staff uh, on implementing the buffer zone law. And frankly, I think it worked really well here for a number of years. So I was equally upset uh, and disheartened by the Supreme Court's ruling a couple of months ago. But look, the legislature worked with the attorney general, with the governor, to get a new safe access bill in place. It will be the job of the attorney general to enforce that, and I certainly will. Um, we, we've seen uh, we've seen the problems with intimidation and obstruction uh, and harassment over the years, and it is really important that we uh, vigorously enforce mm -hmm. that new safe access law so that patients and workers are protected as they go in and out of that yeah. building. And you know, when you asked about police, I do believe that police can exercise the discretion. They do that day in and day out. Uh, maybe not out in, in mm. Ferguson, Missouri, yeah. as we were talking about. <laughs> I think that's what we're but, getting at here. But I think, yeah. you know, current uh, commissioner, Boston Police Commissioner Will Evans mm. was a captain uh, mm -hmm. over there on Com Ave and was responsible for the Planned Parenthood site and did a marvelous job over the years. Uh, uh, fighting back obstruction and intimidation. And I have faith, uh, and certainly I will work with police and district attorneys to enforce the law. Yeah, so I was an original sponsor of the original buffer zone, uh, and uh, I, I was pleased that uh, the legislature acted as quickly as it did. I've also spoken to Commissioner Bill Evans about this issue, and, and specifically, I, I went over there a week ago Saturday, the first Saturday where the new law was in effect, and watched and observed, first for a while in my car, and then uh, walked over and actually talked to some of the guys and like, see how it's working. It's early yet. The important thing here is not who the commissioner is or, or what his or her disposition might be towards this. It's what the law is, because commissioners will come and go. And a woman's right to fair and accessible health care and safe health care is, is something that, that ought to be sacrosanct. And we need to make sure that the protections are in the law, irrespective of who the police commissioner is or anyone else, to make sure that a woman has unfettered access to make her health care decision. And, I, and I'm concerned. Uh, I have a friend who's had four miscarriages, uh, mm -hmm. who went over there and is, is uh, entrusted uh, with pictures of fetuses in, in, in front mm -hmm. of her. That's wrong. No one should have to endure, endure that after going through what she had to go through. And so I, I, that's why I went over there. I'm going to be very vigilant when I'm hopefully attorney general. I'm going to be watching the implementation. I'm going to visit that. There was a there was an investigator from the attorney general's office there, and I applaud Martha Coakley for sending someone over there to watch it and ensure that women have the access that they ought to have. And that's right, because, you know, there's an investigator there from the AG's office, as there was when mm -hmm. I was uh, civil rights chief, when we were preparing to implement that law and to defend it through the lower courts. And I went down to the Supreme Court in January to see that through and to see the team's uh, uh, argue that case. It is incredibly important and I know from having worked closely with Planned Parenthood over the years, having seen instances where people actually dressed up as yeah, Boston police officers mm -hmm. and thrust papers in people's faces, stopped their vehicles actually. Um, we've seen the, the harassment and the threats and you know I'm, I'm 
I'm proud and pleased to have the endorsement and the support of Planned Parenthood and uh, National Organization for Women in this campaign because they know what kind of an advocate I'll be in terms of All ensuring right. access. Changing the subject here, it's been frequently noted in recent months that it took the federal government, Warren, to bring charges against former uh, probation chief uh, Jack O'Brien. Is there something missing in our laws here? Should this, should, should this have been a state case as opposed to a federal case? Yeah. And I know mail fraud and all that, and they brought it yeah. into a bigger thing, but. Yeah, yeah, he was convicted under racketeering yes, and, and mail fraud. What are we missing are that available. we couldn't do that? Well, I, I think there's a lot of instances where we can upgrade. First of all, the employment process, think about this, the criminal justice system, the probation department, a, a, a fundamental underpinning of the, of the uh, criminal justice system is, is, is up for sale, apparently, according to, to, to what the federal uh, jury came back with. I mean, I find that outrageous. You know, the, the Globe once referred to me as Mr. Payne and the you-know-what on ethics uh, based on my tenure up on Beacon. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of standing up. And, and, and I could tell you, you know, when I'm attorney general, I'm going to be looking for innovative ways to find, if, if this type of behavior goes on, I'm going to send the message loud and clear, first based on my own hiring practices, merit-based hiring practice. I had breakfast this morning with Scott Hoshbarger. He said one of the things he's proudest of as, a, as former Attorney General for eight years is the fact that he, ha he hired people strictly based on merit and he's marveled and watched at what they've done. That, at the end of the day, is his, le his lasting legacy. Uh, and I want that to be a legacy of mine. You look for and you attract the highest and best quality people to the Attorney General's office. And that should mm -hmm. be the standard that every facet, every department, every component of state government will be. And if I find that people are engaging in this type of activity, I will figure out well, a way I, to pursue them. As you know more, though, mm -hmm. Boston Mayor Marty, well, Walsh came out and said he didn't think O'Brien did anything wrong, that, that patronage in itself is not illegal. He was just doing what everybody else did. H how do you respond to what he said? Well, I think that we've seen, and, and, and Warren, you alluded to this, and I know you were in the legislature in the 90s and personally observed some of this. I mean, this is unfortunately, uh, in the eyes of many in the public, politics as usual, business as usual. And it is incredibly important um, that uh, as Attorney General, if elected, I investigate and prosecute cases of public corruption, um, of any instances where there's fraud on the system. And, and you know why, uh, Emily? It's because I fundamentally believe that we're a rule a system, a uh, democracy based on rule of law. It is really important that people have faith and integrity in our agencies and in folks in government. And I'm going to work to ensure that. I certainly bring uh, an independence uh, to this. I've, I've not uh, worked on Beacon Hill. I've worked with folks on Beacon Hill. But, uh, but we need to make sure, whether it's Beacon Hill or whether it's within state agencies, that we're ensuring that people are acting in ways that did, are did, with did integrity. Did Speaker Baglio get a raw deal, Warren, being basically an unindicted coast conspirator? Part, well, he's entitled to due process, thought. so if there are charges going to be levied against him, then he ought to be have the opportunity to, to respond to those. So, uh, but, but, you know, I'm proud of my record on Beacon Hill. You know, he served eight years up there. I, I'm one of the most independent legislators in the last 50 years on Beacon Hill. I sued a sitting House Speaker over funding for clean elections. May have been the only state senator to have ever served with Billy Bulger not to have voted for the Democrat wise anyways. I banned smoking in the, in the uh, state house over the objections of a chain smoking Senate president. I got the, the, the act for the, the uh, honor, the highest honor from Common Cause because of my independence in pushing campaign finance and ethics reform. So I'll take a back seat to no one for my uh, willingness to stand up and speak okay. truth to power. But I, and, I, and I appreciate that. And I think that the work you did then, Warren, was terrific. Um, the difference in, in being you. attorney general, no, it's important. <laughs> and we agree on these principles. Um, the difference is when it comes to the attorney general, it's about making investigations, making cases, putting together the evidence, putting people in the stand and and taking a case to trial and that's what I bring in terms of my experience mm -hmm. as uh, an assistant attorney general as a former prosecutor as a civil rights attorney frankly because as you say when it comes to issues of criminal justice reform how important is it that we have people in the probation mm -hmm. department entrusted with the care and rehabilitation of probationers that they be people who know what they're doing and not just someone's cousin. All right, I'm running out of time. You only got time. We're as, as you know, because Warren Tolman has said this before, he would like to require gun manufacturers here in the state of Massachusetts to install smart technology, fingerprinting devices, all that kind of stuff. 
Does the AG, in your opinion, have the power to do that? And by the way, since Massachusetts is such a small market, wouldn't that just drive the manufacturing somewhere else? Well, let me give you my, my view on how we get at gun violence. I agree with Warren that smart gun technology makes a lot of sense, and as Attorney General, I will work to mandate that through legislation. But that's just a piece of the puzzle. I was with students the other day over in Dorchester, and we were talking about the fingerprint technology, mm -hmm. which I support. But a little guy asked, said to me, well, what do you do about the guns in my neighborhood? We've got 300 million guns in this country on our streets right now. And so I am so heartened to see the legislature act and pass this new gun reform bill. As attorney general, uh, I would have responsibility for enforcing that law. That means cracking down on gun trafficking, giving re uh, resources to police to enable them to better trace guns and criminal activity, and uh, targeting resources at at-risk youth and, and efforts that are there to prevent um, repeat cycles of, of violence in our communities. So I just want to jump off a, that because I'm running out of time here, but more, one of the things that frustrates people so deeply, and the Boston Herald has done a great job mm -hmm. with this week, this week, is unsolved crimes. Sure. We had those, the second anniversary of those three beautiful young women from Dorchester. The fourth one was shot. She's in protective custody. I mean, somebody knows something. Somebody knows what happened. Why is this so difficult? Well, first of all, they, people have to have the confidence of the law enforcement that they can come forward and they won't be prosecuted for some old warrant that's out there and the like. If you come forward as a witness, you want to let people know that, look, we'll, we'll talk to you, we'll keep you, we'll protect you, we'll keep your name out of it. But getting back to the gun violence issue, because I think this is a key part of the contrast between Mara and I. Um, the, there's one person in Massachusetts that can unilaterally implement smart gun technology. It's the Attorney General. Express statutory authority was given in 1998 by the assault weapons ban. I was a sponsor of that. I'm proud of that. Um, and I will do it. We all support it, you know, in theory. But those guns in those neighbors, in neighborhoods in Georgechester and the like, if they have smart gun technology, they're not going to be stolen because if you steal them, they're useless to you. They have someone else's mm -hmm. fingerprint on them. They're, they're not going to be, be utilized uh, or used accidentally by a little kid who picks it up and inadvertently fires it. It's a fundamental difference. Look, I get that people don't want to take on the NRA. I took on big tobacco long before it was popular. I, it wasn't an easy thing to do. My mom, my dad, and my aunt had all died from smoking related illness, and I said right. enough yeah. was enough. But, so but on, to you, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, on that, it, it, and I think that, that what you're not appreciating, Warren, is the reality of the situation, the fact that we've got a lot of illegal guns out there uh, I, I, in our neighborhoods I, I and in our it. homes. And so, look, uh, I know this Attorney General worked real hard on this gun reform legislation. It contains a lot of great things, giving police I chief agree. discretion, cutting down on trafficking. These are all things we've got to do. Um, and I'm committed all to right. doing that. There's much more I wanted to get to, it. but we're out of time. That's part of it, Emily. It has I'm to be sorry, part of the but equation. But that's it. Maura Healy, thank you. thank you so much for coming. And Warren Coleman, good luck. Thank you.